So, first of all, talk about what, what exactly is working capital. Um, essentially, it's, it's cash that is needed to keep the business running on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the accounting definition is the cash in your stocks plus the cash in your debtors minus your creditors. And, and that gap in the middle is, is your working capital gap. That's the amount of cash you need to actually keep your business going. And it's normally expressed in days, so it's how many days you have cash tied up for before you actually release that back into the business that you can use either for growth or back into your working capital. So the longer the gap, the more cash you've got tied up. And for different types of businesses, this, this gap changes. Uh, so for a, a retailer, take Sainsbury's, somebody like that, uh, they'll have a fair bit in stock because they need to keep stock uh, plen replenished, but they won't have a lot in debtors because you're paying cash at the till. So they have a very short working capital gap and they'll stretch the creditors as well so it actually reduces that gap even further. You take somebody like a, a steel stockholder, they will actually have quite a long working capital gap because they have to keep a lot of stock in, in, in the premises. Uh, they'll be paying people like Chorus uh, very quickly, um, but then their customers will want longer credit terms as well. So th the, the working capital gap can actually vary from business to business. So what can be done to try and alleviate the working capital gap um, is to try and move everything towards the, the, the left-hand side of the screen as you look at it. So try and reduce your stocks, um, which is... Easier said than done, you have to bring in things like just-in-time delivery, uh, so somebody like Toyota is very good at, at doing something like that. Reduce your debtors, chase people harder, get them to pay sooner, um, again, easier said than done, uh, or extend your creditors. Uh, but for the small business, each of those things is very difficult to do uh, because of the economies of scale that you've got. The people that you're dealing with are either bigger than you uh, and can dictate the terms, uh, or you just find it very difficult to, to get cash out of people. So what's the scale of the problem? Um, PwC reported recently that there is uh, several trillion actually tied up in working capital globally, uh, and that a few improvements that could be made, uh, you know, there, there could be serious cash released from, from the working capital just to continue trading and growing at a modest level, there's over 300 billion euros of cash that is needed globally. And these are things that can be improved out of the working capital cycle. Since 2009, though, uh, when the, the, the banking markets collapsed and failed, there's a further 500 billion uh, that has been tied up in the working capital cycle. Um, that's massive amounts of money that are just there in businesses that can't be unlocked. Uh, and are restricting the growth. And whilst the cycle in days has reduced, things like margin pressures uh, have increased that as people look to increase their, their margins, more cash actually gets tied up. And because of this cash being tied up, the global investment levels for growth have actually been reducing over that period. Some of the contributing factors, um, graph's quite an interesting one because it, it, it shows the demand levels and the increases uh, in banking facilities since 2009. You can see a huge drop when the markets crashed. Uh, and then since then, uh, bank, level has been, uh, bank lending has been falling every quarter, uh, apart from a very small rise in uh, early 2014. Bank of England also reported that uh, the demand, uh, certainly that, that middle chart for medium-sized businesses, has actually been outstripping supply. There is a huge demand for credit out there and for working capital. The BBA, British Bankers Association, uh, also showed that in 2012, 21, uh, nearly 22 billion was available in overdrafts for SMEs, uh, but that's now down to just under 20 billion in quarter three 2014. So two billion has disappeared out of overdrafts for SMEs in that two year period. Further graph there from the Bank of England, it's actually the yellow uh, boxes, it probably doesn't show very well on there, but the yellow boxes are actually getting smaller as overdrafts are reduced. Why is that? Part of the reason is the new BAL3 regulations that are coming in. Uh, the banks have to look at every single deal on a granular level before they could make an assumption across their, their asset class as to uh, what they'd be prepared to uh, put aside as risk capital. And if you look at the whole stack of uh, the way that probability of default is, is worked out, and probability of default is a determinant of how much uh, risk capital is needed, gilts are right at the top, all the way down through listed companies, personal debt, SMEs are at the bottom, 
high probability of defaults, means a high level of cash that is actually needed to be held against an SME, making it very expensive for a bank to actually lend to a business. So they hold more regulatory cash. Things like on-demand facilities are very expensive for them as well. They have to hold that cash because it could be called at any time. So not only have they got the regulatory capital to hold, they have to hold the cash for the actual facility as well. Debenture-led security. Debentures are charges on the business assets, so their debtors, their stocks, uh, any unencumbered assets in the business are actually deemed as high risk as well by the banks. The reason for this is it's now uh, a floating charge. Uh, they don't actually get a fixed charge on, on the assets in the business unless they're monitoring things like the debtor book on a very regular basis. So again, seen as very high risk for banks, means more regulatory capital is required. There's less of a, uh, a, a, a desire by the banks to actually lend uh, on overdrafts. So what can be done? Well, we've heard a lot today about the advantages of the alternative finance sector the speed that we can do things at, much quicker than the banks. We all hear stories it's taken 12 weeks to get an application through just to get a referral back, and then another 12 weeks to actually get something approved, another 10 weeks to actually get it drawn down. Simplicity, we're actually making things easier, we're making things quicker. Transparency, it's what you see is what you get. Come onto any of the websites there, people want a loan, they know exactly what they're getting, they know exactly what they're going to be charged and they know exactly where the funds are coming from. There's also a willingness for uh, these platforms to lend. Investors are looking for yield. We've heard from institutional investors, but there's also the retail investors, high net worth investors out there, all looking for yield. There's cash available. There's probably more cash out there than this market can cope with. It's just being able to access it and get it through the platforms. And fresh thinking, ability to use other business assets. You know, we'll hear on the panel uh, about a few new ideas that are coming around. Um, th there's different ways about thinking about things. It's not just the staid banking model. There are new ways of actually looking at how to get the cash to businesses. One idea is the single batch invoice finance, a market invoice platform Black have led the way. Uh, more recently, we, we've joined that marketplace with our, our tie-up with the Interface Financial Group. It can be one invoice, it can be a batch of invoices. It's not done over a whole book. It covers short-term needs, very much like an overdraft. It can be used once in a year, it can be used several times in a year. Very, very flexible product. Much cheaper for those smaller batches than a traditional invoice discounting facility. Term loans, so again, some of the, the platforms that offer the term loans, it's actually easier to get a term loan from one of the platforms than it is from a bank, and we're not restricted by those capital adequacy rules. We can actually look at a business actually on its own rather than a wider sector policy and say, yeah, that's a good business, that deserves to be funded, and we can get the cash into those businesses. So a couple of case studies from Assets Capital of, of deals that we've done. Uh, Christmas goods retailer, so this was baubles, inflatable Santas, Christmas trees, you name it. Uh, they bring it in uh, for Christmas. Needed 180,000 to finish off a shipment of half a million pounds. Uh, bank were very uncomfortable because it was trade finance, the goods were coming from China. We looked at that business, two year trading history, everything they were bringing in they'd sold several times over the year before. We were able to complete that and fund it within uh, seven days and we got fully repaid within 10 weeks. Again, flexible, fast, easy, use the different uh, business assets. And an engineering business uh, wanted 100,000 to expand their range, um, also export into the US. New product, uh, they make vaporizers uh, for veterinary medicine. Uh, and instead of using brass, they were using aluminium, much lighter uh, material, much cheaper to produce. Again, the bank said no because the business was 18 months old. But look beyond the actual ownership of the business, you'll see that it was an accountant that ran the business. Uh, it was actually his accountancy firm that owned the business. And by cross-charging against the accountancy firm, a much stronger, more established business, we were able to say yes, that loan's continuing to, uh, to pay down very nicely. The business is growing very strongly. So two good examples of, of what alternative finance can do to try and repair that working capital gap. And that's it. Thank you.